just started. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how to start this. I can see. All right. I think we're all set. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Ted Morgan from Skyhook. And uh, what I wanted to talk you through today was uh, more of a perspective from the business side. As someone who's running one of these companies, trying to establish uh, our technology, trying to sell stuff, trying to win customers, get deployments, um, very focused on what are the business issues that uh, impede the growth of indoor location. As Kaveh said, there's, there's literally 20 newish companies out there today focused on indoor location technologies and there's probably been uh, 20 over the last 10 years that have, that have uh, embarked on this as well and they've all, you know, suffered some uh, growth and um, adoption issues and part of that's the technology and, and technology uh, maturation uh, but a good part of it is some of the business resistance to this and I think uh, what we're trying to do, and I'll certainly talk through here, is at least eliminate those, uh, some of those business hurdles so that everyone can compete purely on the technology side uh, and not have some of these uh, artificial uh, challenges to it. Now, uh, Skyhook, um, uh, it, it, if, for those who don't know, uh, we're a location platform. Uh, our goal is to get on, uh, to run the location on as many devices as we can. We are a mass market. Uh, technology company. Our goal is to be on hundreds of millions of devices as a general purpose uh, location system. Uh, we sell and deploy on uh, some of the biggest names in the uh, consumer electronics industry. And what we're really focused on is getting a consistent, reliable location system worldwide. Uh, so it's not that we aren't interested in it, but we're less focused on uh, delivering extremely precise location in one or two places. We're trying to provide great location everywhere. Uh, and so the scaling side of it is very important to us. Uh, certainly uh, other techniques for triangulation have been around for years. What we brought to the table uh, eight or nine years ago was this idea of scaling Wi-Fi location around the world. Uh, and so that's really uh, our perspective. It's a, it's a little bit different. Um, and coincidentally, we actually launched the company eight years ago uh, at CTIA. And it was part of this, uh, the first location-based, the LBS challenge, the first time they ever had a location contest. And we had all the largest names in technology from Qualcomm and Cisco and others who were judging it. And what they did is they actually, you had to build apps or services to show your location capabilities. And what they did was actually take you and the judges around in limousines uh, through the streets of Atlanta where CTIA was. And they had this route. Uh, going through the city and you had to show your service or app and we were showing Wi-Fi location which everyone uh, obviously thought was crazy um, and we had mapped the whole city before uh, going down there so we had driven it and scanned for all the Wi-Fi <clears throat> but there was a about a quarter mile gap where it went through kind of a warehouse area where there was no Wi-Fi at all and so we we're really worried about as you would go through that part of the thing the judges would see that the system really has issues when you don't have uh, coverage in these areas so Mike, my co-founder, and I actually rented a car and put it right in that corner where there was the dead spot, and we actually had an access point uh, running inside that car that we mapped. And so as you took the turn there, instead of using someone's home access point or business access point, it was actually using one that we had planted in a car, uh, just to kind of fill in all the holes so people wouldn't understand that. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's a lot easier because we're combining GPS and Wi-Fi, and the coverage is just uh, phenomenal, as you saw from from some of those pictures. Um, high level, our viewpoint on where uh, indoor location um, is today, uh, it's, it's slow. Um, I think we've, the great thing is compared to what we had even four years ago when we started this, um, uh, we started getting deployed on major devices and in fact, uh, Kaveh's first conference in 2008, uh, you have to think back, it's only four years ago, but the App Store wasn't even alive yet when we did this conference four years ago. And so the whole idea of uh, individuals getting comfortable with using location on a variety of ways just didn't exist yet. It had been some navigation apps, it had been feature phones, but it really hadn't embarked upon what we've seen today where there's literally tens of thousands of apps that use location. And what that's done is it's really conditioned uh, consumers into understanding that their location can be detected and all the great ideas they have. And consumers 
are executives of big companies, are people who own retail stores, and so they all now start to get a better understanding. You know, four years ago when we were talking about deploying location into some of these areas, it was, it was a different concept for business folks. Now they use their Android or their, uh, their Android phone or their iPhone all throughout the day, so they really start to expect this. So you get a much easier conversation. Uh, we're seeing a number of vendors do fantastic work in delivering great precision in particular venues, but it is um, onesie twosies. It's a handful of venues. Even Google stuff was maybe a dozen or two dozen. What we're trying to do is think of a way we can scale this to every property, uh, and how can we do that as soon as possible? Um, you know, there's been a, a little bit of um, what we call overselling in the, in the industry, um, not necessarily. Um, saying that from a judgmental standpoint, but more that it's created some confusion among the property owners or the venue owners. Uh, they're really just not sure what to expect uh, and how to deploy these systems. And that confusion is one of the things that slows down the adoption of these. And so we're seeing, and what we've uncovered in the last year or two, and we've, we've actually validated this with a dozen or so other indoor technology companies, is just a general resistance from venue and property owners because of some of the, the issues I'll talk about uh, through here. Um, so I'll walk you through a couple of real examples of conversations that we've had uh, with venue and, and property owners. Uh, one is just on corporate campuses in general. This is um, uh, Aetna's campus out in the Midwest, you know, massive campus with tons of buildings. You know, everything's Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, they would love to have apps within the enterprise for finding your coworkers, for scheduling meeting rooms, for knowing where assets are. Uh, but they're, they're hesitant because uh, they're trying to figure out what's the best approach. And frankly, they know where all these access points are and they have a good sense of the network because they built it. Uh, but they're reluctant to share it with third parties because of the proprietary nature of it. They're not concerned what happens to their data. They're not sure how long it's going to take to survey. And so that hesitation is really what keeps it. In fact, um, the folks at Cisco can tell you, you know, they have the look the actual location of millions of enterprise Wi-Fi access points. They know where they are because they put them up in the ceilings for the corporations. But they're not allowed to share with them because it's proprietary data. Uh, and it's this asset that's being held back that would actually help all these systems perform a great deal more. Um, another example is on any of the retailers, particularly somebody like Best Buy. Uh, one of the issues that's really hurting Best Buy is something called showrooming. When you come into the store and you play with the printer, you play with the, the big screen TV, but then you shoot the barcode with your phone and you find it cheaper online and you have it delivered to your house. So everyone's using a Best Buy to play and feel comfortable with it, but they're not buying there. So Best Buy has a lot of apprehension about these mobile technologies. In fact, some of them are even talking about trying to block cellular signals inside the store so that you can't do those comparative shopping tools. Uh, that's just the concern they're having because the company is literally falling apart because of some of this. Uh, and so what they would like is some control over, they want to deliver these mobile uh, buying experiences, but they want to have control over it. What they don't want, frankly, is to help uh, a company like a Google or a Microsoft map the whole facility, build out all these apps, but really what Google's delivering is a price comparison tool to help you find the cheapest price outside of Best Buy. And so that kind of control, whether real or not, is their perceived concern about uh, <coughs> rushing forward into some of these technologies. Um, <coughs> this is another example of a, a major public spot uh, casino operator, MGM, who's very forward thinking. Uh, they've actually worked with a bunch of companies to build the indoor maps. Uh, makes perfect sense. If you've ever been to a casino, you get lost. So partly they want you to get lost, but just finding things is a nightmare. And they actually want to do a ton in mobile. They want you to be able to do gaming while you're on the property. They want you to be able to find things. They want a concierge service. They want to do tons of things to extract more money out of you as a casino attendee. Uh, but what they're worried about is working with another company that then makes money on their own. And they want every nickel that's spent in that casino to somehow be coming back to them or to participate in it. So if they're going to let you go in there and do a site survey throughout there, they're going to want some arrangement where they get a piece of the action. Um, and I think they're working on those one-off, but that slows it down when you have to negotiate with each individual venue some agreement as to who owns the data. Uh, the last one here in this set is Simon Properties. Uh, they run all the major malls uh, around the U.S., the largest mall operator, and very, very advanced in terms of an innovative in trying to deploy new technologies. Uh, they really have done a bunch of uh, great projects, and I think a, a number of you have been working with them on helping it easier to find your way through the stores and do promotions. Uh, but they have, a, they have a concern about 
getting locked into a particular vendor? What's it gonna take to do these site surveys? What if this vendor's technology isn't the best or I get tied up with it? What's my control over it? And so they've, you know, they've tried a couple of these projects, but you don't see them going full tilt across the board. They've done some hardware solutions. Now I've got these hardware boxes all over the place. Uh, these are the things that slow down widespread adoption. So we'll continue to get you know, dozens of venues, but what we want to do is have the venues and the property owners contributing this data because it benefits them right out of the, right out of the box. Um, and that's some of the, the, the things we've heard consistently across the board um, and something we want to try and help. Uh, so the real uh, impediments we've seen purely from the business side, having nothing to do with the technology solution or performance, is them looking at the time and the cost of doing a site survey and what's the approach I should take here and what does it really entail to get down to the kind of accuracy they want. And then as I have that, what do I have to do on an ongoing basis? You know, do I have to maintain hardware? Do I have to re-site survey? You know, all these kind of things are confusing to folks. And then when I do that, this other company has my data. And if I have a good relationship with them, I can control it. But if it's a big uh, general market, uh, general purpose company like a Skyhook or a Google, you know, what happens to this data and who can use it? That's a real concern. And then lastly is just education over understanding what's really possible, what it really entails, <clears throat> what can I do with this data. You know, I think it, it reminds me a lot of this picture of parents on Christmas Eve when you're trying to put together those crazy toys for your kids. You really want to do it, you're really trying, but it's so damn confusing and it's so frustrating. And that's the sense we get from venue owners is they really want to do this, but they can't get a sense of what the clear path is. So one of the things uh, we've been working with, right now it's about 15 other companies, and I think it can be 20 plus, uh, a number of you are here as well, um, is a way to try and alleviate some of these concerns for the property owners and put them more in control. And so the idea here is purely to give venue owners that kind of peace of mind and control over what happens and encourage them to proactively looking at ways to share their data, to roll out these apps so that we can accelerate the adoption, which would we believe would benefit uh, all of us. Um, this uh, industry initiative has nothing to do with the core technology side of it. It doesn't make judgments about different techniques or different radio signals. It has nothing to do about accuracy. It's purely about how can we address some of those business concerns uh, that the venues have. And so what we've done is we're working with a couple of the chairs at the IETF um, in this actual uh, GeoPriv working group. Uh, that are reviewing a draft specification that these 15 companies are all actually collaborating on today uh, as a way to address some of these. And there's really two elements to it. Uh, one is really just a data format standard, a data exchange standard. So the, the, the data collection that happens can happen in a variety of ways. You can know where your access points are and just say here's the list. You could do a detailed site survey. You could measure all the types of signals. But the output of that is formulated in a standard so that if you could give this to your one technology partner, you could then give it to anybody else. And anyone who participates in this standard can read this data and use their algorithms in the best way possible in their distribution model. Uh, and so all of this, what it does is if I work with a vendor, I'm not locked into them. And that's, you know, obviously, we're all trying to lock in our customers, but this is one area that concerns them. So if I roll out this, uh, with a particular vendor, I can output the data and then I can do whatever I want with it. Um, <clears throat> and, and the second part, which actually I think is the most important, is ownership of that data. I produce this data, I can send it anywhere, but I ultimately control what happens to this data forever. It never gets outside of my hands. I can set any kind of rules I want about the usage of that data and anyone who participates in the standard uh, abides by the rules I set for that data. And so the data ownership is like digital rights. It's like digital rights on music. It's a copyright. You know, this is the site survey in my building is my data. And I'm going to help you do it with your tools, but I get to do whatever I want with it. And I can put rules based on it in a couple of different ways. One is based on time. I can say, hey, anyone can use this for a year. After a year, it's over. You have to come talk to me again. I could put a cost on it. Like MGM Graham could say, you can use this, but we get some percentage of your revenues on that. And so for you to use that data, you are signing essentially a legal contract to say that's how you're gonna use that data. And you could also say the types of uses for that. Uh, so Best Buy can say any app can use this data as long as it's not a comparative shopping tool. And so they could get better precision for things like finding your way around the stores and learning about products, but not to go off and buy it on Amazon. And so those kind of rules will allow them to have control and we're using uh, standard Creative Commons uh, models for specifying the rules around this. 
And so the idea for a property owner like a Best Buy is they work with their favorite vendor and they scan the facility as best as they can. They can then protect that data by applying these license provisions on them and then publish out to anyone who accepts the standard. With the idea being, I want to get on as many devices as possible to work better inside my facility, but I want that control. Uh, and so Best Buy could say, you can use this for one year. There's no restrictions whatsoever. I'm going to publish it out to my indoor location companies. I'm going to publish it to Apple, or Skyhook, or Google. But after a year, you know, the day that year ends, that data is removed from the system. And I can decide what I want to do from there. Uh, and that gives them that peace of mind. And so the, again, the, the idea is Best Buy can go and collect that data, signal data, it could be manually submitted AP locations, it can be really any of the technologies that Frank was describing in this standard format, send it out to all of these providers and know that they have control over the ultimate usage of that, of that data. And we've gotten really good feedback from not only the technology providers, but the venue owners like Simon and Best Buy and others. And we're gonna to continue to try and get them involved so that we want to have happen is a venue owner can say on their own, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to aggressively push this out because I want all the consumers in my store for their apps, regardless of what it is, to work better inside my facility. With that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.